I think there is something very important that I want to cover. Is if you ask me, do I have any regrets? And I would say, one, huge, huge, which is at some stage, I put myself in a position that I could have a mental health issue. And I was partly responsible for that. And I regret that, regret that massively. So let me tell you what happened. But just in case anyone is affected, those calls would deal with let you uh, visit either mine or uh, an equivalent Spanish charity, or you can reach out to me. So if you hear of an academic, I guess that something like this comes to mind. You know, someone with their feet up. Well, this was my workload in late 2019. The top set were my jobs here at this institution. And lower are the ones that I was doing for external engagement. And obviously you read the list and you say, well, I mean, that was bound to happen, right? Why do you become involved in all this? But I didn't have much of a choice for most of this. In fact, I did say I did not want some of them, and I still got them. And these are my fault, but sometimes you can't really plan. Things develop in a way that you end up doing something that is not necessarily something you have planned. Obviously, it's a pretty massive workload altogether. But our academic life pushes us to do this. Because if you look at the promotion papers for us, for any advancement in the career, you are expected to do everything you did before and the new stuff. You never untick a box. You always take on more work. That's how the career is set up. This is the paperwork for promotion at professorial level here. And you see the sentence at the top. You have to do everything that you did before as well as new stuff. So it's a bit of impossibility, isn't it? So what did I notice in late 2019? Well, I was really getting really, really stressed. And I went to a conference, and I shouldn't have gone. Became more stressed during the trip. I started actually avoiding colleagues at the conference. I didn't know what was going on other than I was really stressed. I couldn't prepare the presentation I was due to give, and five minutes before I was due to do it, I pulled out. I spoke to the organizer, and I said, I can't do this. Sorry. I avoided colleagues for the rest of the conference. I actually wondered whether to return to London altogether. Why? What for? But I did board the plane. And on my way back, it really felt like that. Everything I've done is absolutely wrong. And in the context of Brexit, I believe that I brought the college into this repute. I know, it's not realistic, but that's what was in my mind. So I actually thought that my behavior would trigger riots. And as we were landing, that's what I expected to see. As we broke through the clouds, I was expecting to see fires in London which weren't there. At home, I believed that my family was going to be the target of attack. And as you can imagine, I was creating havoc around me, both at home and at work. And obviously, I had to go away and deal with it. So, diagnosis by a psychiatrist, acute anxiety. But problems don't come on their own. All this came along as well. So, you know, I believed things that weren't real. I could not leave my bedroom for a few days. I was dying every night. My wife can tell you that I was dying every night. Completely lost my self-confidence and had a massive weight loss in just a few weeks. So, you know, it's serious stuff. So that's what it felt at the time, that really my career had gone to pot completely. I wasn't going to be able not go back here, just actually go and buy something in the shops. But with, you know, what triggered that? I've actually done a lot of thinking in the last three years, as you can imagine. So what triggered that to me? That workload is manageable if everything goes well. But you know full well that that's not the case. Things are going to go to pot at some stage. So that's what started happening. I lost key people in the lab, and I was struggling to do the direct supervision of students. The time and the detail that was required, I hadn't done for a long time, and it was a struggle, a big struggle. 
this was a job that I very much loved, actually, because it allowed me to work with Michelle and Elaine, who are really, really competent people, and we had a fantastic personal interaction. But that job was going to be taken away from me. I thought we had done a fantastic job for the 10 years. I really enjoyed that interaction. And while a reduction in workload would be beneficial, I was really sorry to lose that particular job as a result. I was, still am, the director of this center, and I feel I'm not doing anything. I don't have time to do anything. Uh, and that, really, I wasn't happy with. And externally, we were in a financial crisis. I was the chair of trustees of a charity, and I was really, really concerned with the charity folding and having to make people redundant, really concerned with that. And the workload as editor of the journal just kept increasing. And I just could not handle it, literally. By the end, the feeling is I cannot solve anything. No matter how simple it is, I can't. I can't. This is in the context of Brexit, some more art. This is a painting by my son as part of his A-level art. And this is what we Europeans felt after the Brexit referendum. We were labeled as migrants. It was a really unpleasant climate. And having worked in this country, in my case at the time, this was 2016, so it was 21 years. We got a label, a stamp on ourselves, and it really became unpleasant. And obviously, this didn't help. And that was the overall background of all this. So <coughs> what happened? Obviously, I had to go away. I had to have medication and sort myself out. But there are always positives. You know, When something happens, something is going positive. And well, my family here in Spain obviously rallied around me. My colleagues took my workload away and delivered my duties. And the NHS actually gave me great support. But there are three people who actually did massively at that time and before. Versha, who is here tonight, led one of the projects in the lab, the Ataxia Tilangectasia project, in a way it's her baby, and she produced records and experiments in such a way that when her time to move on came, everything was perfect for us to understand. I could come back to those data a year later and understand everything and make myself up to speed on the project. And I will never be thankful enough, Versha, for that. But Versha had to move on. And Ellie, who at the time was a PhD student, took the brunt of it. She had to effectively run the lab, support a more junior PhD student, support our final year of our research students doing their projects in the lab, and she took a massive amount of work, being herself a PhD student and part-time research assistant. So Ellie got through a massive workload herself and did fantastically well. And again, I could not thank her enough. And finally, Sahar, who is here recently, three months ago, undergoing her online Viva, uh, just put her head down, carried on working, and did the best, the best she could with the support of the other guys. So I'm incredibly proud of these three, because they did really, really well. When I was away, I just had to step back, get better, and they had to get on with it. So three of you, you know, I'm really so proud of you. And, in my perception, my career was coming back up a little bit. Um,